Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I think I know many of you here tonight, but for those who I don't, my name's Katie Wickram Singh, and I'm the founder of KTW and The Wick. We're a global consultancy and content platform, and really we're on a mission to connect the culturally curious and to help businesses understand the value of art to make them more aware and more engaged. Uh, we recently launched the platform, The Wick, earlier this year, and really that platform is very much for people just like those in this room. Those who are based potentially in cities, have busy lives, who are culturally curious and want to learn more about the art world. They may be working in it or they may not, but we really hope to tell some of the human journeys and stories along the way. So I'm incredibly excited this evening to be joined by none other than Lady Kate Bryan, presenter, curator, author and art historian, and importantly, a good and great friend. <laughs> so, we are going to be discussing Kate's new book, Bright Stars, great artists who died too young. So, it's important to mention, if you aren't familiar with the book, there are actually going to be some copies over in the corner on sale, which Kate will be signing at the end of the talk. So, please keep a look out for those. Um, in terms of Kate's accolades, they are far too many to list in full. She hates it when I do this, but I think it's important to mention she's a very accomplished woman. Um, she's the head of collections at Soho House, overseeing a global collection of artwork of over 7,000 international artists, many sourced locally. And I think it's really important to mention, this is not Kate's first book, it's actually her second. She created another in 2019 called The Art of Love. And she's also host and presenter of Sky Art's Portrait of the Year. I know much loved amongst many of us. She's also much loved mum to Juno. I don't know how she does that, we'll get onto that shortly. I think what's important to mention as well, part of the reason Kate and I wanted to come together to do this conversation and talk is really because both of us dedicate a lot of our working lives and our personal lives to championing and working with artists, whether they're ones who've been underrepresented, marginalized, or those who we feel deserve more of a voice and a platform. Kate's actually done this also with the collection here at the NED in the vault. So there's an incredible collection which is actually currently based 93 women artists, including Maggie Hambling, Jenny Holzer, and Tracy Emin. They're next to just seven men. And that collection, when it formed, was really an inversion of the FTSE 100 index, which was outlining the fact that only 93% of companies that were leading the UK at the time were run by men. That's just one of the examples where Kate's curatorial knowledge and creativity has come into play to create something super powerful. So let's get on to the job at hand, Kate's new book, which I think it's important to mention as well, whether you're from the art world or not in the art world. There is everything in this book. There's sex, drugs, rock and roll, murder. It's a really rich, salacious read of over 30 artists who are gone too soon. So Kate, thank you for joining this conversation. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you all so much for coming. I know, it also it feels, I mean, I have to give a shout out. I mean, both of our parents are also here, which I think <laughs> yeah. you know, it deserves a shout out. Um, but um, I do want to start off, I mean, Kate, this is such a complex book and I think it's important before we go into the rich narratives and stories behind some of these artists is really to get a sense of the making of the book because it's complicated there's a lot of research and a lot in it so firstly how did the notion of the book come about and why did now feel the right time to do it um, actually do you know what I realized as you were asking me that question I came up with the idea for the book here at the NED because as always I go into meetings entirely unprepared and I was meeting my editor here at the NED because she'd never seen it before and my first book had just come out and she wanted to see the NED and we met for a coffee here and on the tube on the way here I was thinking that there was a I had an idea to present to her but I thought it was a bit dull and so if you think the book's dull then you're off to a bad start and so I was thinking about this idea of artists that I loved 
and the idea that they maybe didn't have that much time to make work. And some of my favorite artists, Van Gogh, only made work for 10 years, Anna Mandietta for seven years, Basquiat for 10 years, um, uh, Modigliani only painted for six years. And I thought, how on earth do I know who they are? Like I work in the contemporary art world. I know it's really hard for an artist to create a practice to understand who they are as an artist, to sort of gain momentum, to build a following, to have people follow them, to look at what they're doing, to sustain that over decades. And so what, what do you do if you only have such a short time making art? So that's really the, the idea for the book. And actually growing up, my dad had this book called The Good, the Good Die Young or something. It was about movie stars who died young. And so I nicked that idea basically. And I've gone on record as saying that now. I mean, on that note, so about, um, Stars dying young. So some of you might be familiar with the popular cultural term of the 27 Club. And really that was coined after the death of Kurt Cobain, who obviously lost his life at age 27 alongside lots of brilliant musical and rock and roll legends. And it's worth noting in this book of Bright Stars, you talk about the age being around 40. So how did you settle upon that age? Well, I was, I was in, I didn't want to kind of fetishize youth. So, because actually th there were artists that didn't become artists until later. So Van Gogh actually didn't become an artist till he was 27. Um, and I was thinking about how art history is made, the kind of slippery concept of art history. In so many senses, we think that there is one art history, it has been written in stone and there's only one way of telling a story. And as I've come to realize in the last, 20 years and more intelligent people came to realize it sooner than I did that art, hi art history is shifting and changing and actually it's ours for the rewriting all the time. So I felt that actually you know, I needed to have a really good look at lots and lots of artists from across the world who didn't have a long practice, so i.e. died too young. But you know, they had to kind of get to become an artist and then have a bit of a practice. And then, so it seemed 40 was a good age and actually, I wanted it to have quite a big span of art history. So it actually covers 500 years. It goes all the way back to Raphael. And I think there's a misconception that, you know, of course Raphael died young, because everyone died young back then, you know. But actually, Raphael is mentioned in the same breath as Michelangelo, who lived until his 80s. And Leonardo lived 50 years before them and lived till his 70s. Rembrandt lived until his late 60s, but Vermeer died at 42. So I kind of had to use a benchmark of other big names. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be very, strict cutoff that you if, to be in the book you would have lived um only 40 maximum but then there were artists that lived until like 43 that i love so much and i was like well it's my book so um i put them in anyway um, and obviously you wrote a lot of the book or um, completed it and during a pandemic and there is a lot of hard to reach narratives in there particularly of those who may be due to economical reasons or gender reasons, were, you know, their, their practice would have been less documented. So how did you go about that complex process of finding out everything that you needed to create this mm. incredible book? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's any point in sugarcoating it. Their practices weren't documented because of extreme prejudice. I mean, whether that was because they're a person of color, whether they're a woman artist, whether they're a queer artist, someone who had been marginalized. And so, yeah, it was, um, it was difficult. I didn't, I, do you know, I wrote the bulk of it on maternity leave, which is then sort of rolled into lockdown. And so it was a great project to have with a, you know, a young baby to sort of keep my brain going. And I was very well supported by my family. Um, and that's why I was able to write. And, um, and then the lockdown happened and I was able to continue. And actually what was really important about the lockdown is it gave me this breathing space and this thinking space because I'd written a, probably 75% of the book before lockdown. And then the publisher said, listen, we're gonna delay it. We're not, no one knows what's going on. We can't get these things printed. And, so I had this period of time where I wasn't working on it. And then I was able to go back to some of the chapters I'd written. And I was really excited to see that the needle was shifting, particularly for artists who I had really felt like I was championing and um, that I could see more things happening for them. And that felt just so exciting to see an artist like Noah Davis, who had um, founded the Underground Museum, a really important artist who paintings kind of revitalize art history and painting through the prism of the African-American experience. And to see his practice after um, last the t summer of 2020 with the murder of George Floyd, Floyd, to see that sort of transform and to see his career be just angled slightly differently and to have a bigger audience. And I saw that with a couple of the other artists. So I was glad that I had that time to reflect. And I was glad that the tide was moving in the right direction. But yeah, the, the lockdown was... Um, sort of an interesting time because I think a lot of people who are writing books thought, oh, this is great, I've got more time. But actually, you had so little access. Mm. It, was, it, was, it was actually tough. 
I think also, as we know, the, the lives and careers of artists are ever-changing. So a couple of them actually, as we mentioned earlier, Khadija, for example, her breath is invisible, public showing during lockdown, which obviously then got written into the book. So it is a very sort of current read. And I think let's go into some of the, the narratives and the stories, because there really are some incredible ones and too many to go into. But why don't we start with 1990s and Herring? Because I think most people in the room will be aware of Herring. Yeah, actually, who came in with the Keith Herring top on? Like, very on brand. Thank, thank <laughs> you, Henrietta. I mean, that's just gold star. Um, and which goes to my point, which is the ubiquity of Keith Haring imagery. And I, I think Keith Haring is an artist that I think it's important to understand quite how serious his practice is. So you might be someone who goes to museums and galleries quite a lot and you go to the gift shop and there's like a Keith Haring skateboard and there's a, a colouring book for children and they make such good gifts. Um, he made this language which is very universal, very simplified, sort of reduced line. He's very famous for the kind of radiant baby, um, the dancing guys. And what I was... Um, really touched by it with Keith Haring was that he genuinely wanted to create a language that transcended um, uh, culture, time, space, people, age. He, you know, he wanted a granny to love his art just as much as a kid, and actually they tended to. Yeah. And he created something which was sort of reignited um, a real appetite for contemporary art in sort of downtown New York, in a city that was broken, underfunded, abandoned, neglected, not very well looked after. He just used to go around the subway, and there would be these like black posters which were for advertising. But because New York was so rotten in the late 70s, no one wanted to advertise there. No one. What, it was just sort of abandoned in a, in a sense from the rest of America. And so these things were just black, empty spaces. And he would take a chalk down and make his drawings. And sometimes he would do like 200 stations in a day. It's just insane. It's just up and down the subway. And those became really quite quickly highly sought after. And people would like peel them off the wall. And he always said he knew he would die young, but he didn't know that he was going to be caught up in one of the most sort of tragic and extreme parts of human history of the 20th century, which is the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Mm -hmm. And he, um, epidemic, and he when was the first person to go on record publicly and talk about it. So he was like the star of New York, making this fantastic work. He's at all the clubs. Um, everybody loves him. He's photographed with Michael Jackson and Yoko Ono and Brooke Shields and Madonna. You know, you name it, he's part of that circle. But as soon as he went on record in Rolling Stone, very publicly, the first person to do an interview of that nature and say, I've been diagnosed with HIV, the invitations just stopped overnight. And he could have just kind of shut down, but actually he decided that he wanted to, he said, listen, I knew I was gonna die young. I think he kind of had that thing in his mind about being a bright star that burned too bright, too fast. So he created this extraordinary um, estate, and it's the first example of this, where an artist actually sort of foresaw their early demise, worked out the image licensing, worked out what he wanted the money to be for. And since his death, he's raised over 100 million US dollars for charities connected to children and HIV and AIDS causes, which is just an unbelievable legacy. And anyone wanting to think about an artist's legacy should look at the Herring Foundation and his estate and what he achieved. But I think and also, it's just he, amazing. I mean, what's amazing about Herring, he was so beyond his time in so many ways, not just in the commercialization and anti elitism of the art, but also in the way that he used it in, in senses of activism mm. that people are doing now. And I think, in terms of his estate, obviously, what's, what's amazing and quite touching about his estate, it was actually driven or being, I think, I believe it still is, by his studio manager. Mm. Um, so when he passed away, Julia, I think, is the studio manager who has taken that foundation on and handles all the licensing and the business running of it. And it's quite a powerful legacy. And I think this idea of championing comes across quite clearly in the book. So there are some incredible artists, even if we look at someone like Van Gogh, who I could not believe, by the way, painted everything he painted in a decade. Can you believe that? I, I couldn't believe that. I had to read it twice to check. Um, but um, in terms of his champion, so he had um, Joe Bonga, who was championing him, and that comes across quite regularly in the book. So can you talk Talk to us a little bit about some of the champions that were so prevalent. Yeah, I mean, I think that was such a motivating factor. Van Gogh, my favourite artist as a child, like how on earth do we know who he is? He had such a short career, very famously, you know, seen as a bit of an outsider, didn't sell any work in his lifetime. Um, and actually, it's all down to Joe Bonger, who's his sister-in-law. So he um, had a brother, um, 
Theo Van Gogh, who was an art dealer, was really supportive of Van Gogh's career, we used to send him paint, send him money. I mean, I love Van Gogh, but if you want to love Van Gogh, don't read his letters, because he is such an ass to his family when he wants to be. And they're so supportive and lovely to him. But he just had these, like, kind of tough relationship with people sometimes and he was um you said he's also quite misrepresented right i, I do lust think he's mis life and yeah i mean mad man painting exactly away. i mean the, the movie lust for life i think has got a lot to answer for because it's a hollywood movie it plays for a record 37 weeks in the cinema wins golden globes oscars everybody you know laps it up and it shows him like eating his paints and kind of painting in a fit of madness like practically stabbing the paintbrush of stab stabbing the canvas with his paintbrush the implication being that he was a great artist because he was mad and somehow the madness is exciting to us and maybe we that nihilism appeals to us but actually van gogh was really well read spoke many languages is a sort of highly cultivated person was well known to art circles when he died you know monet says that we've lost this great talent pizarro's at the funeral the first people to buy his artwork is like degas and manet this is not some outsider lunatic by any stretch of the imagination it's just that the 20th century recast him as that because it's kind of convenient for hollywood but actually he was you know he was a someone who had you know, extreme ill health and in an age more nuanced about mental illness, I think we should reappraise him because his painting was what kept him alive in many respects. Like he, he could paint between bouts of illness and it was by receiving good care and having good therapists that he could become the artist that he deserved to be. And some of his best paintings were made in San Remy in the asylum. But after he dies, his sadly, his brother dies six months later of syphilis. So there's no one to look after these artworks. So they kind of just by law go to his sister-in-law, Jo Bonger, and her family are like, oh my God, get rid of them. They're like under the sink, under the bed, in the cupboards. You know, painted like 900 paintings and 2,000 drawings and no one's bought them. So that means she's got all of them. And she's like, what am I gonna do with them? And then she decides actually to relocate to another city. She becomes like the most badass art dealer ever. If you wanna know how to do a deal, read Jo Bonger's letters. She, she has the National Gallery, you know, beg her for work she manages to sell 200 paintings in her lifetime it's just unbelievable and it's because of joe that we know who van gogh is it's because of joe actually that we have the sunflowers in the national gallery in london because she manages to convince samuel courtauld who's the famous american art collector in london to um to buy the sunflowers and give it to the national gallery in london i mean she was such an operator and because of her careful maneuvering of his work that she really believed in she really believed in it that we then have van gogh as this like national hero an international hero the world over you know after the second world war the sunflowers get thrown in a cab true story from the national gallery down to what is now tape britain unattended in the back of a black cab goes to the exhibition and 5,000 people a day turn up to the exhibition to see it. They wear out the floorboards and he becomes a national hero and he's just this like, the sunflowers becomes a symbol of optimism in a you know, post-war Britain. And he, he, a bit like Herring, wanted to find a universal language to speak to people, to give people some kind of hope and beauty from, from their lives. And he succeeded in doing so, but we wouldn't know who he was and they could so have easily have been gone if it wasn't for Joe Bonger. Yeah. And in terms of people creating their own languages and being a bit of a rock star over time, I've got to go to Basquiat. I know it's predictable, but I love Basquiat. Um, so Herring's contemporary, um, 1980s New York. And I think what was interesting about Basquiat is that, again, many, many different representations of him. I'm sure we've all seen the portraits of Basquiat and Warhol, this idea of this intercreativity and cross-pollination between music and art, which he did so well. Um, and he actually was part of the 27 Club, if I'm not incorrect that he did die of a heroin overdose actually in Warhol's apartment. Um, but why do you think Basquiat has had such an enduring legacy? Well, I think he's got an enduring legacy now, but I think it's a very unstable legacy. And I guess that's one of the points I was trying to make in the book, which is that, you know, Basquiat is so singular. He was an artist who really came of age in this really exciting time in New York, as I've described already. But 
he was an artist that was able to kind of synthesize everything that was going on around him in a really unique way. He was like a, a great sampler, like a jazz musician meets a kind of video montage artist, like putting all of his experiences into one painting. And he experienced extreme prejudice as being a young black man in New York, certainly being a young black man in the art world. He was fetishized as a young artist, definitely one of the first artists ever to kind of go from you know, a few hundred dollars to tens of thousands of dollars to hundreds of thousands of dollars in his lifetime. You know, depending on what report you read, he was earning anywhere between a half a million US dollars and 1.2 million US dollars a year in cash as a stipend from his gallery. You know, that wearing Armani suits to paint in. You know, but yeah, he still couldn't get a taxi in New York. He had to get a limousine everywhere because no taxi driver would take a young guy with the kind of hairstyle he had. And so, um, he, you know, is ex experiencing this extreme vortex of like privilege and deprivation and prejudice and the kind of the exotic heights of the New York um, cultural elite. And what's really tragic about him is that he is such an important artist that he's made work that really resonates. I think for young people today, he might be the first artist that is their entry point, like Van Gogh was for me. It might be Basquiat for them. I hear it all the time. When there was a show just down the road at the Barbican, um, the, um, they broke visitor records with their Basquiat shows. 215,000 people went to see that exhibition, which is just an unbelievable number of people. And yet, there was not one Basquiat in the UK permanent collection. Like, we don't own one in the UK, and there were very few in permanent collections in museums in the US, which is absurd. He's the most expensive US artist of the 20th century at auction um, recently. Um, his work selling for something crazy, like 150 million US dollars. But the reason there are no works in permanent collections is because he was seen as like a darling of the art market. You know, they used to call him the black Picasso. It's just disgusting. And they, when he passed away, a lot of his collectors, who were great collectors of his and had bought in depth, people like the Rubels, who are really important collectors, got beautiful space in Miami, they offered to um, give their work to US museums. So they were like, he didn't paint for very long. You know, we, we should make sure these go into institutions. He didn't have time to have those museum sales happen necessarily. And there was a definite apprehension about acquiring his work because maybe he was just like an art market darling. He wasn't the real deal. And so they didn't, and we didn't have any in this country. And now it's really the, or, the audience, as always, people who are art lovers, the public, people who believe in great artists that resonate with them through books and through shows, who have decided, no, this is an artist that's really important, and now the kind of museum world has to catch up. And now, of course, they're so expensive that it's really difficult to do. And is it right that the ones with the skulls in obviously they seem to go to market at higher level. Exactly, there's this whole kind of like horrible algorithm kind of cultish, that the, yeah. the, the auction houses have and it's worth this much more and mm. it just is, it's kind of um, sick. Yeah. And I'm sure people saw uh, Tiffany's ad, I hate to mention brands, but you know, um, the Basquiat, Basquiat painting appeared there and in Freeze as well. I mean, it seems like it's, it's definitely been a proliferation recently. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it's important that Basquiat is just part of the canon. Yeah. And they should just, we should just have him as part of the canon. But I think, in a way, it's, uh, the book is trying to pull back the curtain and mm. sort of show you a bit of how art history is made yeah. and the perversity of it. And in terms of, I suppose, rock stars, there's a couple of people that I did want to mention. She loves um, a rock star. I love a rock star. Bardo of Wimbledon, mainly because <laughs> I was living in Southwest for ages, and I love the idea I would have bumped into this woman had I lived near her. Um, Pauline Boaty. Mm. So, so Paul, yeah. <laughs> she, um. I mean, she obviously founded the new movement of British pop art, but I think there's some incredible stories around her lifestyle that um, she obviously had, you know, tragedy as well. But I think there's a story about yeah. her being visited in hospital. Yeah, she's an amazing, amazing woman. I mean, she was like, she was so cool. She was a really good artist, but she was so cool that when Bob Dylan arrived, and this story's for you, Dad. When Bob Dylan arrived in London for the first time, they were like, who's going to take him around London? And it was Pauline Boaty, you know, like, so she was in Alfie as a walk on part. She was the part of that amazing RCA pop art movement. But because she was a woman, she wasn't allowed to study painting. So she had to study stained glass. And so she studied stained glass, but actually her paintings are all the better for it. The way that she splits up the canvas, the way she thinks about um, almost painting in a collage fashion. A lot of those artists, like Peter Blake, would be the first to say that he, he saw so much in Pauline's work. She was in that group, you know, Peter Blake, David Hockney, 
Paolozzi, just an incredible bunch of artists, Kitage in that kind of 1960s London, proper swinging 60s stuff. She has her first solo show. She gets a solo show as a young woman artist graduating, which is hard to do now. And it's 2021, I think. And she manages to, you know, not only get that show, but sell loads of work. She's really well considered. Um, and really tragically, she gets um, diagnosed with cancer at a routine um, prenatal scan and refuses any treatment to save the child. The child is born, she takes the treatment, it's too late. She's on her, effectively, a deathbed. She's smoking a lot of marijuana. And the Rolling Stones rock up to visit her because she's Pauline fucking Boaty. And she smokes weed with them and she draws them. She does this beautiful drawing of them. And it's like this woman, like how much more do you want her to achieve? How much more do you want her to be in the middle of a cultural vortex? How much more can she stand for the swinging 60s? And pop art, by the way, is so well expressed through the eyes of a woman. You know, the idea of like commodification, idealization, this new rampant modern world that we live in. Like it's so great to see it through a woman's eyes. And she dies and her paintings are completely hidden. They're literally hidden, and they don't get rediscovered until the 1990s. They're gone for like 30 years. This art historian, David Allen Meller, another torchbearer, finds her work in a barn. I mean, it's mm. absurd. He's watching a documentary when he's a kid called Pop Goes the Easel, and she's one of the artists featured in it. Big Ken Russell thing on the BBC. And he grows up, he's like 15 when he watches it, and he grows up to be an art historian. This is all just so random. You get the sense that none of this could also easily not have happened. Grows up, says, where's that woman that was on that documentary? Her work was just wicked. And then can't find it, tracks it down, puts it in exhibition in the Barbican in the 1990s, and is a bit like, phew, cool got away with that one we nearly completely left out a really important person in mm. art history and then it's like tumbleweed nothing and so now we are reappraising her now she's being written back in because people are doing great work but still she, her work only just went back on display at Tate Britain Ali yeah. Smith's written a really beautiful book where who's she's sort of an um, amazing author who turns her into a fictionalized character but it's it's slim pickings and she should be someone who's on the national syllabus you know we should yep. talk about Pauline Boaty and David Hockney and Peter Blake you know like um, we're not but I think that's what's fascinating about what you write in the book as well is that so many of the artists that we now see as major pivotal figures did drop out of history or mm. um, collections for you know tens of hundreds of years at a time and I think Caravaggio and Vermeer are two that you mention um, but there's um, there's also a few stories of, of artists that I mean I know I had never heard of and wouldn't be familiar with if not for the book and there was one quite a tragic tale of Charlotte Solomon so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about her because there's something quite iconic about her despite her tale being extremely tragic yeah I mean I think that Charlotte Solomon is um she always makes my heart beat so fast when I talk about her because her work means so much to me and her story is ought, ought to be again to be on the national curriculum internationally because what she stands for is so singular she's an artist who um, is murdered by the Nazis in Auschwitz, aged 24, four months pregnant, and um, she's an artist who, more importantly, you know, created a singular work in the history of art. Griselda Pollock, one of the most important art historians, says it is an event in the history of art. She made this work really to save her own life. She was not because she was persecuted by the Nazis, but actually because she had a lot of problems in her family. And it's like 200, over 200, 260 gouache paintings with overlays, like transparent overlays with text and directions of what you should listen to when you're looking at it. It's, a, it's like a fresco, it's like a graphic novel, it's, um, it's just absolutely expansive, it's autobiographical, but it's universal, it talks of young love, it talks of unrequited love, it talks of family drama. Yeah, there are scenes of the Nazis in the background, but she doesn't let them come into her world, this is her own world that she creates, and this is what artists do, you know, they conjure new worlds and they shape new realities, and she does it just so powerfully. It's kind of, um, it's like she looks at this old form of art called a singspiel, which is like a lesser German opera, um, where there's always some comedic quality to it. So it's funny as well. And um, she manages to get it smuggled away to safety to her father, who manages to get it after she's murdered. And um, 
you'd imagine that then it's like, oh, where did that get hidden? But it was never been hidden. Her dad showed it to Otto Frank and Frank's dad. I mean, why is this not a movie? And it's always been on permanent display at the Jewish Historical Museum in Amsterdam since she, um, since the Second World War ended. And yet it's not taught, no one knows about it. Tashin only just produced the first volume to look at it. And if that is not a singular perspective on the 20th century, then I don't know what is. And I think that she's been basically murdered twice, once by the Nazis and once by art history. And I think in terms, um, carrying on, um, on that narrative, which would you say was the artist that you felt most surprised by when you started researching? Who, who was there where you thought, God, I, I thought I knew about this artist and actually I'm finding out all of these new things that I wasn't aware of? Do you know what? Most of the time, most of them. <laughs> I, do know what, I do know a bit about art, I promise. But um, there's always something you're like, I can't believe that. You know, like really. So, well, there I mean, were artists. Sorry, murderer as well, Caravaggio? Oh, I knew, I knew, I, I knew, I knew Vaj was a murderer, yeah. <laughs> um, and he, but he, his, his work's really important. It, it sort of seems like really contrite to kind of come up with your own colour. But actually what he was trying to do was create a bit like Herring and Van Gogh. We've already talked about some sort of universal touch point for people to be able to come to and just find transcendence. And in it, he saw the infinity of the sea and the sky. But actually, I was really struck by a lot of his other practice and other things that he had done and how forward thinking he was. A real pioneer. Um, and actually, had he have lived longer, I think he would have. I think he was just the kind of artist the art world would have loved. Coming into the 80s and the 90s and noughties, and you know, he had a very cheeky sense of humour. I always had this fantasy that you know, had he have lived longer, he would have curated a show for the YBAs, and it would have just been off the wall. It was just been someone who could really understand, with a piercing insight, what it was to try and disrupt art history from within. So I think I underestimated him, and I was pleased to kind of familiarise myself with him. And which, um, there are a couple of artists I know we've talked about which um, were particularly poignant and sort of personally relevant to you. Mm. Um, do you mind telling us a bit about those? I think one was Bartholomew and mm. one was Khadija. Yeah, so um, definitely the two hardest uh, chapters to write. By the way, there's loads of really fun stuff in the book as well. Just going to say that. <laughs> Um, like Raphael died of a sex-induced fever. We'll come to that later. I've just shagged himself to death, apparently. So, um, but um, there, there, there was a lot that was difficult about the book because obviously you are looking at art history through the prism of death, and it was about wanting to celebrate artists. So I didn't want to be morbid, and so I wanted to always choose artists who taught us something and whose maybe had not had been here very long, but who meant so much to so many people and should continue to mean so much. Um, and one of them was Bartholomew Beale, who just, just completely, tragically died while I was writing the book and was my friend, who was a young artist. He died at 30. He died on Boxing Day. And um, I'd been his champion. I mean, I gave him his first big solo show on New Bond Street when he was a young artist, and I'd worked with him. And I always thought he was just, he was the, one of the most passionate and alive people I'd ever met. And I often think to myself, if I'm in a bad mood, and I'm grumpy. I'm like, just try and be a bit more like Bali. Why are you being such a bitch? Like, he's just lived life so well. And actually, I had no idea, but he'd been diagnosed with a brain tumour when he was like 22. And he lived with this concept that he was going to die young. Herring suspected he would, but Bali probably yeah. knew he would. Yeah. And he got well and was able to paint and was able to just make a beautiful body of work and actually there were so many lessons like I would say a million lessons that a young artist could learn from his practice mm -hmm. in terms of how he conducted himself how he painted how he lived well how he was with people what kind of impact he made like literally every intern at the gallery would remember Bali and every director at the gallery him, yeah really everybody super, just loved yeah, him really cheerful just that's, his paintings are also incredibly beautiful. Incredible, very yeah, really wise beyond his years. So that was a difficult thing to write because I never ever anticipated having him in the book. Mm. I started the book, I was a few months in and then he passed away. And so, you know, there's a lot of biting back tears trying to capture the, the sort of enormity of what you're feeling and also realizing this is a book about legacy and our, uh, how art history is made. And now I have to be responsible for trying to create a legacy for my friend. Um, and the other chapter that you talk about is Khadija Say, which is, um, you know, there's just no words for how tragic Khadija's 
um, death is, but there are so many words for how beautiful her art is. I mean, she's just an incredible um, young woman. She um, was, you know, not from a well-off background. It's difficult to get into the art world. It's particularly difficult to get in the art world if you're from a low income and if you're a black woman. Um, as she was, and she managed to fight her way through to the just the extreme absurdity of showing at Venice Biennale in her 20s. Just amazing, and she deserved it. And everybody saw her work and loved it, and she made these beautiful, beautiful self-portraits which sort of looked at her... Um, spiritual heritage and cultural heritage. Her family had come um, from the Gambia. She'd arrived in, um, was born in London, but you know, got a camera when she was age nine. And these self-portraits really reflect this, her Muslim family background, Christian family background, this sort of intermingling of spiritual practices, what it is to be other, what it is to be a, a product of that kind of childhood with all of these different things happening and the mm. sort of the, the to be proud of it but to enter the art world unsure of your place the nuances of that and she used this wet plate medium so it's very unstable so they just look like beautiful victorian tin types i mean just just unbelievably ghostly images and they show at venice biennale and everyone's like oh my god these are amazing everyone wanted to buy them people writing about them no one knew anything about her background one just actually in one in in our in the office. Yeah, working, exactly. Yeah. I mean, they're just amazing work, and um, so she kind of had to beat the system to get yeah. there, you know. And um, and you know, she shows in Venice, and a month later, she comes back, and the murderous fire of Grenfell takes her, and so she beat the system, but then the system took her, and it's just so hard to get your head around how that could happen. And um, Khadija really is an inspiration for young artists to say that there is a way into the art world and mm. that there is a place for you and that your voice is valid and that we need you and we need a multiplicity of voices practicing art and that, that her art is so valid and she can be a real inspiration and mm. so much amazing stuff has been created in her name since she died, far too young, far too young. Yeah, into Internships and yeah. all sorts and she's been exhibited but you know that's basically like a... Um, it cannot happen again. Yeah. I've seen in the book. I try and demonstrate how easy it is for yeah. people to be written out of art history, and we have a collective responsibility to make sure that Khadija stands for uh, Khadija Say's name is known, and mm -hmm. that she is able to stand for what she believed in, because she was an activist even as, at such a young age, and a beautiful, beautiful person by all accounts. So I think um, if anyone hasn't seen Khadija's work, if you're an artist, do um, check it out because she's an example of someone really pushing themselves forward. Um, and talking about the human journeys and stories, we can't not mention sex, relationships, <laughs> love. There's a lot of it in there. <laughs> How do you find out this? I mean, firstly, which, come on, which artists were, I mean, there's, there's a lot of them who were playing around. <laughs> I think, as you said, one that died. That was my first One book. died during, yeah, exactly, during, <laughs> during the act, apparently. Yeah, no, um, I think, um, well, I love Raphael's story because it's 500 years ago, so it's a bit easier to laugh, isn't it? But also because he's just gone down in history because his biographer, this amazing biographer, Vasari, who wrote The Lives of the Artists, said, you know, that Raphael was so interested in love that in order to make sure that he could really paint love and beauty, which is obviously this, like, platonic concept that they loved in the Italian Renaissance, that, you know, he had to, he had to spend a lot of time with beautiful women in order to be able to paint love. And he would love the company of good-looking people and would stop them in the street in order to be able to just look at their face. It's just like, this guy's just a creep. But okay, Vasari. Um, and then Vasari writes that he died from a sex-induced fever with his lover. And because Vasari wrote it, everyone's like, well, that must be true. Um, and for hundreds of years, everyone was like, Raphael just like shagged himself to death. And people have just bought it to the extent that actually he stayed more relevant art historically. This is like a positive story in the book, that he stayed more relevant art historically because people like Picasso, who is like also bit of a creep um, and the giant of the 20th century made this series in homage to Raphael of, and he does all this all these like quite pornographic works about Raphael and his lover La Fornarina or other artists who are portraying um, Turner even portraying Van Gogh sorry Van Gogh um, uh, Raphael going to the Vatican with his mistress and so I think that other artists really kind of loved this idea of this the modality of sex and the you know to fetishize that kind of saucy liberated life the be the ultimate renaissance bohemian um but actually you know he probably just had like 
flu. <laughs> so it's not as not as good a story. But Vasari, like if you want someone to do your PR, then maybe get Vasari to do it because yeah. he'll tell you a good be story. Perfect. Um, so before we move on to questions, um, the big question is, um, what do you think that we in this room and also the art world as a whole can do to sort of move these legacies on to help protect um, the future um, stories of artists? Well, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to ask for a fuller spectrum of art history. So if you're going to an exhibition, if you're going to a gallery, just be thinking about a plurality, plur Lots of voices, um, because you know the the you know someone like Amrita Shergill is an amazing artist. She was right there with Gauguin, and she, you know, is an absolute superstar of India. But no one else outside of India know who she, who she is. And so, if someone's curating a show about like expressionism, we need Amrita Shergill in it. I mean, it's just a no-brainer. So I think it's about that. And I think actually, if you're attending exhibitions and there's a catalog, buy the catalog. Yeah. Sounds silly, but like someone like me, decades later, is desperately trying to research these artists. And if people buy catalogs, it helps the museum to know that there's an audience, there's an appetite, and they'll print the catalog. So often, a woman artist or a person of color or a queer artist, or a specially abled artist, or an outsider artist, might get the exhibition, but they might not get a catalogue. Yeah. That's a problem later on, decades later, because we need it for the archive and the research. Well, and you're so, obviously archiving a hell of a lot of artwork yourself, yeah. with the collection of... So, I don't know if, if you've all visited Soho Houses, but across the globe, they are filled with some of the most incredible artists and artwork. So, in terms of the way that you're curating, um, you obviously pick artists from a local area, but how, how has writing this book affected the way you plan to curate? Which, which house are you working on at the moment? You're always working on incredible, exciting projects. Yeah, I'm working on Brighton, Nashville, LA, New York at the moment. Wow, that's a lot of art. Yeah, <laughs> with, <laughs> with my great team, yeah. And in terms of the book, and has it changed the way that you're going to work, do you think, the way you curate? Has it affected any of your decision-making? That's a really good question. I think um, I'm always looking for a plurality. Pl can't say it. Why do I keep plurality. trying to? Lots of voices. Um, but um, I think even more so now, I'm conscious of trying to push ourselves all the time and what haven't we uncovered and who can we help along and um, you know how can this collection be useful we always want it's a very artist-led collection so um, and we're very lucky that we have such extraordinary art in the collection and the artists really trust us and we're really proud of that but that's how we're able to have such a beautiful collection but it is every time you enter a new city it's just such a privilege to get to meet all the artists and make friends and you know go on this journey of discovery and we're always trying to think about how we can better serve the story of that city through the voices of artists but yeah it, it makes me realize that you know that you have to just push that much harder and work that much harder because there is quite a big weight of art history which is very white, male, straight dominated. That's just all there is to it. And I'm not saying don't look at Hockney, I'm just saying look at Hockney and Pauline Boaty. And I think that's what a lot of other people are saying as well. Um, so to just constantly just keep pushing yourselves, I mean, no, you know, I just cannot afford to be complacent. And we're in such a privileged position that we start with that perspective first and we're always we looking for so new voices. We also have so much more access, don't we, through yeah. technologies and information yeah. to get to artists now. Yeah. Um, teaser, head of our next year's talk. What are you writing at the moment? Nothing. What's the plan? Come Nothing. on, share it. No writing Don't whatsoever. Lie. You've no. always got a book on the go. She no. says, I'm not busy. And then she goes, Kate, I've just written a book. <laughs> There are no books on the go. What, will, what would your dream next book be? One that writes itself. <laughs> it's really hard to write a book. I mean, it, I don't want to underestimate that. It's really hard. But do you know what? I would, I would really love to do a book about the Sir House Art Collection, mm -hmm. and I will. And I'm going to get someone like Sue Webster, who's one of our star artists, to tell me other art that she loves in the collection. And basically manipulate the artist into writing the book for me. That sounds Because I want to hear well, from the artist. We can't wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> Sue um, wrote a beautiful book, so I was a teenage bouncy, so you'll be, you'll be perfect. <laughs> Sue, just write the whole book. <laughs> so, Kate, thank you so much. Um, I want to throw out questions, if we haven't answered all of them already. Um, does anyone have any questions? 
But thank you very much for um, yeah. such incredible intelligent insights into every. I mean, I don't even know how you do it, how your brain can hold quite so much information. I don't know if anyone else thinks that when they hear of Kate speaking, but um, I'm astounded. No, thank you. Thank you for reading it as well. I told her that I could send her the questions in advance because I felt bad that she had to read it, but she <laughs> did read it, bless her. Um, so thank you. And thank you to the WIC because it's much, much, much needed cultural platform. I love what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for coming.